In this tutorial, we're going to look at fossils. The first aim is to describe how fossils are made, then explain the limitations of using fossil evidence, and then finally explain the significance of the pentadactyl limb. For a long time, people believed religious scripture in that the world was 6,000 years old even though evidence from fossils was saying that the Earth was much older. Some people shrugged it off and said, well, that's God just trying to test our faith by trying to trick us by putting fossils in the Earth. Thankfully, we had rational minds like that of Mary Annings on the case. Mary Anning was a revolutionary fossilist. Born in England in 1799, she lived in Lyme Regis. This is an area which is famous for having many Jurassic era fossils, in other words, dinosaur fossils. Mary Anning remains to be a prominent female in the scientific world for the following reasons. Before Mary Anning, people essentially collected fossils for their aesthetic value and also as a collector's item. Mary Anning was one of the first people who actually studied fossils on a scientific level. From this, she determined many things like the anatomy of extinct animals. In fact, she helped develop the notion of an extinct animal. Before Mary Anning's contribution to the scientific world, people believed that fossils were the remains of existing animals. They couldn't even entertain the idea that they were the remains of extinct animals. She found fossilized remains of the digested contents in the guts of fossils. From this, she could work out the ecosystems in which these prehistoric animals interacted with. She was also a master actually obtaining fossils from the rocks they were embedded in. Fossils are essentially rock, and they're embedded in another type of rock, so separating rock from rock is no easy task. You have to be very precise and delicate, and of course, very patient. Most famously, Mary Anning discovered an entire fossil of a plesiosaur, a huge dinosaur that lived underwater with four fins. Here you can see the scale of a plesiosaur next to a human, which is approximately 1.8 meters in length as opposed to 14 meters. These are actually her recorded notes on the discovery. So what are fossils? Fossils are the preserved remains of once living organisms. Fossil formation can occur in three ways. This is method one. An organism dies and is trapped under sediment on the sea bed. Now over time, the soft areas of the body decompose and wear away, leaving behind a skeleton. Over time, minerals in water replace parts of the organism. So you see the bones of an organism contain tiny pores, little holes which water can get into. The water contains many dissolved minerals which get deposited inside the pores of the bones. Over time, the bones wear away, but what you're left with is a hard cast within the rock. So what you're seeing here aren't actually bones, but rather a mineral cast of the bones. That's why many fossils are in fact rock. The second method of fossil formation is organisms can leave an imprint in soft materials like clay. And what happens is as the clay hardens, it preserves that imprint. Method three is the most exciting method for fossil enthusiasts. This is where entire organisms can get preserved in areas where decomposition cannot occur because there's no oxygen, for example, or it's too acidic, or it's too cold. So many fossils are found in glaciers, peat bogs, where it's too acidic, and amber, where there's no oxygen. For example, in Jurassic Park, they find a fossil of a mosquito, which has dinosaur blood in it, preserved in amber. This, believe it or not, is the fossilized remains of an entire organism, a woolly mammoth found in Siberia. They could even find out its last meal by looking at its gut. That's how much detail was preserved. So that's how we describe how fossils are made, through mineral replacement, through imprint preservation, and through entire organism preservation where decomposition cannot occur. Now let's look at what fossils can tell us and also what they can't tell us. Most fossils are found preserved in rock. Sedimentary rock forms in layers, and you can see these layers in this cliff face here. It's a very common sight. Layers that are lower down tend to be older. Therefore, fossils found in lower layers of rock tend to be older. However, there can be disturbances to the rock which can affect our judgment. For example, if an asteroid hit this cliff face, you might get the Earth buckling over so the older layers become the top layers and the youngest layers are the bottom layers. Just something to consider. So by comparing similarities and differences, we can see how species have changed over time. The best example of this is when we look at the horse fossil record. The horse is one of the few organisms we have the complete evolutionary history of. So you can see early forms of the horse looked like this. They were much smaller and they had three digits at the bottom which they rested on. As we advance forward in time, you can see how it changes. 
you can see the two of these digits start to shift upwards and this central digit becomes larger. Also the size of the horse increases. Now if we look here, those digits seem to have disappeared when in fact what they've done is moved up to this point here. Also, that central digit is becoming much larger. Then if we look at the modern horse, which is much bigger, bigger jaw, but also you can see that this part has become bigger and the central sort of digits become huge. This has become the hoof and the other digits have locked into place over here, giving it tremendous power when it gallops. So by examining fossils, we can work out how big an organism is. We can work out how it moved. We can work out its diet by looking at the wear on the teeth. There are some things we have to take an educated guess about, for example, whether they had fur, the colour of the fur, the colour of the skin, and also the sounds they produced. Also, the most frustrating thing about fossils is there are lots of gaps in the fossil record. For example, if you'd collected all the human fossil remains we have discovered, there wouldn't be enough to fill a small suitcase. But why are there gaps? Well firstly, fossils form deep underground and sometimes we have to wait for fossils to hitch a ride on an up-moving tectonic plate before they become exposed and we can collect them. Sometimes plate movement buries these fossils so deep that they melt. However, most organism remains decompose. It's very, very hard to put a fossil in a position where microbes cannot reach them and break them down. Some organisms don't have skeletons, so soft-bodied organisms decay away completely. So our fossil record essentially dates back to when skeletons evolved. It's very hard to find evidence before this. However, there are some imprint fossils. And obviously, many fossils remain undiscovered at the moment. We're still trying to find that missing link that gave rise to chimps and humans. So that is how you explain the limitations of using fossil evidence. Finally, it's very important that we understand the importance of the pentadactyl limb, the five-digit limb, in other words, our hand. Similarities in bone structure can suggest that different species have evolved from a common ancestor. You see, you'll find this pentadactyl limb, this five-digit limb, in lots of organisms. But what's particularly interesting is how the same anatomical feature can have very different functions. For example, if you remove a dolphin's flipper, you'll see the pentadactyl and it's used for swimming. In moles, it is evolved for digging. Pigs use their pentadactyl to walk on. Bats use their pentadactyl to fly with. And monkeys and chimpanzees, like us, use their pentadactyl for grasping. This suggests that all these organisms have evolved from a common ancestor that gave rise to the pentadactyl limb. It'd be very unlikely that all these organisms evolved from different ancestors. And that's how you explain the significance of the pentadactyl limb.